Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Karan Academy. My name is Karan. I hope you are all doing super well. Today, we're going to be talking about tuberculosis. Um, we'll be covering uh, quite a bit on this topic and hopefully expanding a bit beyond the middle-aged Indian man who presents with shortness of breath, uh, hemoptysis, and weight loss. So TB is an infection caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, as it suggests. It's the leading cause of death from a single infected agent. That's important to know. And the countries with the highest incidence of TB include India, Indonesia, China, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So it's important to ask your patients whether they either are from these countries and have migrated or whether they are frequent travelers to any of these countries. When you talk about risks, we broadly can split them up into risk of exposures and risk of activation or reactivation. So with TB, it is very rare that the first time you get exposed is when you develop the active infection. Most times you develop you or you get exposed to TB, it stays in your body as latent TB and gets reactivated at a later point in time. So risk factors for exposure obviously include being from any of those endemic countries or traveling to them, working in healthcare, as well as crowd, crowded living conditions. Once you do get exposed and have latent TB, later down the line, you can have a reactivation as secondary TB. The risk factors of that happening include being of an older age. Immunocompromised is the biggest risk factor there is. So especially people with HIV um, and those on corticosteroid therapy or having some other form of immunosuppression, huge risk factors. Lifestyle factors like smoking and IV drug use are also important, as well as pre-existing lung conditions like COPD. The one thing that's really important that I want you guys to understand well are the different types of TB, because this is not only important from a diagnostic perspective, but all the testing we do really comes down to this. So I think it's really easy to understand. We we'll just take a moment to talk about it. So first we have primary TB, right? That's the first time you have your infection. So that's the first time you're exposed to it, the first time it's ever in your body. You can broadly have two things happen. Either your immune system detects it, starts a response, which is mostly T cell and CD4, CD8 cell mediated, and starts this ongoing battle to keep it under control, but never eradicates it. And it's always in your body, but it's not bad enough to cause symptoms. That's called latent TB. <clears throat> The second circumstance is that the TB is so overwhelming that you develop acute TB that is symptomatic, that's an infection, that's infecting your lungs, that's causing your coughs and your weight loss and all the TB symptoms that you know. That is active TB. So again, with primary TB, you can either have latent primary TB or you can have active primary TB. What are the differences? So with latent, obviously you're gonna have no signs and no symptoms. Most cases following the first exposure tend to fall under this category. It is actually very rare to develop active primary TB after the first exposure. However, you can see that happen in people who are at a significantly higher risk of developing TB. So your immunocompromised groups, your old people, your HIV positive patients, and so on. In terms of complications, you have obviously a risk of reactivation down the line. And that risk is about 5 to 10% lifelong. With active primary TB, we worry that this might just keep getting worse. And that will be called progressive primary TB. And of course, as you can imagine, it is going to be more likely to happen in patients with an impaired immune system. How do we diagnose this? Now, this is really important. When you suspect latent TB or when you suspect TB in general, you can do tests such as the tuberculin test or the Manto test or the interferon gamma release assay. All these are really good tests in telling you whether your body has ever developed an immune response of any degree to TB. What this test doesn't tell us is it doesn't tell us if it's active, it doesn't tell us if it's latent, it doesn't tell us if it's primary, it doesn't tell us if it's secondary. All it says is that your body at some point in time has come in contact with high enough levels of TB. If you wanna assess whether this person has active TB, you then have to do bacteriological-based tests, not immune-based tests. 
So you want to actually see the bacteria. That can include things like acid fast staining or the zeolysin staining, PCRs, and as well as cultures. You can also do radiographic confirmation tests like chest x-rays where you can actually see the gone foci or areas of TB infection. Treatments are slightly different. As you can imagine with latent TB, we might go for something a bit more conservative. So you know that the stock standard treatment for TB is RIPE therapy, RIPE an acronym standing for rifampicin, rifampin, isoniazid, prazinamide, and etambitol. The treatment for latent TB would be the first two, so rifampin and isoniazid, daily for three months versus active TB, you'd go a bit more conservative, you'd go a bit more aggressive, therefore going for the full-blown rifampin, isoniazid, prazinamide, and etambitol for two months. Now, I'd want to talk a bit, a bit about the Manto test and what it means, because I think it comes up quite a bit. I think it's important to understand what it actually is. So the Manto test, again, it's an immunological-based test where we start off by injecting a purified protein deriv derivative of a mycobacterium and into the skin, um, and we usually inject five units. We then wait 42 to 48 to 72 hours and then measure how measure the transverse diameter of the raised part or the induration, indurated part or the red inflamed indurated part. Now, why does it actually get red inflamed and elevated? Well, it's because your body is reacting to that. So let's say you are injecting um, a mycobacterial purified protein. Now, obviously this is a purified protein, so it's not going to cause an infection, but it is kind of like the spike port protein mechanism used for the COVID um, vaccines. Similarly, you, if your body ever has had an exposure to TB and recognizes this, it is going to send off CD4 cells and CD8 cells, uh, T cells, as well as dendritic cells to basically create an inflammatory response. You are going to create a much bigger inflammatory response if, you, if, if your body knows the bacteria beforehand, right? Versus if it doesn't, it's going to first take a few days to figure out what's going on, what the bacteria is, and then try to sort itself out. Which is why the bigger the spread, the more likely the person has had exposure to TB in the past. Usually, we take 15 millimeters as the transverse diameter, as the general threshold for most groups, and we adopt a lower threshold for people from high-risk groups. So it's 10 millimeters if a person has moved from an endemic area, is particularly old, has comorbidities like CKD, um, and it's five if they have um, either had TB, had a radiographic exposure, uh, evidence of TB, if they have HIV, um, if they have other immunocompromised-based illnesses and so forth. The pathophysiology of TB. So the first thing that happens is obviously TB enters your body. You then have an adaptive immune-based response, um, primarily with CD4 and CD8 T cells. The, the dendritic cells present the antigen to the MHC complexes, and then you have a granulomatous inflammation. So this comes up in pathology teaching as well, but you need to know that this, the type of inflammation seen with TB is mostly granulomatous. What this means is that your body tries to encase everything TB-related in this nice granuloma um, of of basically fibrosis and inflammatory cells and so forth. Basically trying to close it off from all sides. That leads to the development of a GON focus. As you can see here, these are nice little GON foci. Now, a GON complex is basically the GON focus with a whole bunch of gunk around it, right? Usually the GON focus undergoes over time fibrosis and calcification. And that's why you can see them here in white because these are calcified. A deficient immune response can often lead to the development of progressive primary TB, causing progressive lung disease, bacteria, as well as miliary TB. We'll talk about miliary TB in a bit. Now, what is secondary TB? Secondary TB just means that the person has developed active TB now after either indulgence activation, which means that they had the infection before, it stayed in their body, it was latent, but now something has changed. Your immune system's dropped off. Something else has happened, and that's reactivated. Or 
you now have had a reinfection that's obviously exogenous. It's important that secondary TB is symptomatic and infectious. How does it present? Well, it can present with systemic features like low fevers, night sweats, weight loss, appetite, but more importantly, pulmonary symptoms like cough, which can be with a uh, bloody sputum, shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, and so on. Now, how do we test for secondary TB? Now, if you apply what we learned a few slides ago, you know that immunological tests are not going to be good for us. So as, as I've mentioned, if you know someone has latent TB and want to figure out if they now have active TB, what test would or wouldn't help, you know that immunological tests would not be of much good because if you know that this person in the past has had TB, this test is not going to tell us anything new. It doesn't tell us whether they've transitioned from that latent stage to an active stage because, again, your immunological tests can't tell you that. Therefore, we need to opt for bacteriological tests, which would be negative with latent TB, but positive in active TB. Or we can also go for radiographic tests, like a chest X-ray. The bacteriological tests include acid fast staining, that is the zeal Neeson's test. It is pretty fast, but is also low sensitivity because it can pick up other mycobacteria. The PCR is really the best test we have at the moment. It's fast, it's accurate, but it's also very expensive to perform. Lastly, we have the culture, which is the gold standard, but Mycobacterium tuberculosum grows very, very slowly, uh, which is why it takes a long time to develop cultures. Another good point to know about cultures is, the, is that they can tell us about sensitivities. Now, one of the growing problems in the developing world is the uh, rise of multi-drug resistant TB, which is not fun. We are now seeing many strains of TB that are resistant to the common ripe therapy we now use. Therefore, by using culture, we can identify what the sensitivities are, what drugs would actually work, and that obviously is going to be more efficient when we talk about antibiotic therapy. PCRs, surprisingly enough, can also help identify the uh, drug resistant characteristics of certain, uh, of certain in certain conditions. Um, as you can see here, here is what seems like an infection, and this is active TB, um, and here it is highlighted in green. It's important to know that active TB most commonly presents in the upper, lo uh, in the upper lobes slash zones of the lungs. This is because these areas are the most oxygenated. Why? Well, if you think of the lung as one long slinky, right, those kind of spring-like coils, which are being held from the very top, the coils at the top are gonna to be most expanded and they're gonna be kept open, which is why they're gonna be full of air, they're gonna be nice and oxygenated and um, TB being an aerobic bacteria likes oxygen. So it's gonna have a predisposition for the upper zones versus your gone foci and your primary TB, which is gonna be mostly in the middle to lower zones. Well, how would you treat secondary TB? Well, you would treat it very similarly to active primary TB, which, as I mentioned, is intensive ripe therapy. So rifampin, isinizid, presidamide, etambitol for two months, followed by just the first two, so RI, so rifampin and isinizid for four months. What is miliary TB? Now, miliary TB is kind of your worst case TB. It is disseminated TB that affects multiple organs. It usually presents with widespread granulomatous um, kind of structures. Kind of think of it like thousands of gone foci in the lungs. The reason it's called miliary is because these foci look like millets, like the grain, like millet grain. Um, and this is prime. And the reason you have this is because you now have widespread involvement with lymphatic dissemination. Other common sites that can be involved with multi-organ TB, include the spleen, the liver, the meninges in the brain, as well as the vertebrae. Um, and that would be called POTS disease. During my pediatric situation, I actually saw a really interesting case where we had a three-year-old girl who had POTS disease. 
and we had a very hard time figuring this out because she obviously could not describe what the, the symptoms she was having. She presented with difficulty walking um, and had a regression in her physical development and her stages of physical development and gross motor skills. She refused to stand and refused to sit. Um, at first, they did an X-ray of her vertebral column and they saw what they suspected was osteomyelitis. And they started on antibiotics for osteomyelitis, but that did not help. At the same time, when they took a sample of the actual um, infect site of infection, they heard news from the grandfather back in Pakistan, who they recently visited, and he had just tested positive for TB. Um, and so she had miliary TB with uh, POTS disease, and she was started on aggressive rifampicin, the whole ripe therapy. Surprisingly enough, she also had the red secretions um, that are quite commonly seen with rifampin, and we'll talk about that. So the other thing you need to know are the common side effects of these medications. Um, rifampin, isnizid, prezidamide, etambutol. Know them inside out because these do come up on exams. Rifampin includes red colored secretions. These, this includes tears, vomit, um, urine as well, and that's because of the red color of rifampin, often taken as a liquid. Isnizid presents with B6 deficiency uh, and can often present with peripheral neuropathy. Pyrazinamide, because of its role as a purine um, antagonist, can often present with gout, and ethambutol can present with optic neuritis that often can lead to a red-green color blindness. And that's all we had for TB. I hope that was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me on my email or through Facebook. I'm always happy to answer any questions. And as always, please look after yourself and look after your loved ones.